Okay, so I'm just wondering if, if um, like what ideas are there? Because I mean, even an app or uh, an online platform is, has limited accessibility at the end of the day. In, in a context like Cairo, for example, I'm trying to think of like right. how many people are internet users or how many people have uh, smartphones. A relevant question for what we're talking about today is that mapping fundamentally is about abstraction. You reduce a set of information into readable uh, signals and signs. So you lose details, but the trick becomes how do you abstract information and still make it relevant so that you can actually base policy and, uh, I mean, this is a very tricky question. I don't think there's a clear answer to it, but it, so, I mean, there is the fault, and I think a lot of the official establishment, definitely in Egypt, fall into that trap. They create their own maps and they create their own charts and statistics, and then they use them to support ideas that they had even before they created a plan. Uh, so the maps and the charts and the numbers became, become just legitimizing information as opposed to information that, that actually uh, inspired the beginnings of, of a research project or of a plan. Or, so so it's, it's a very contested, I think, relationship as well. Um, I think it, it's really very interesting that we're coming up with what, what you were asking for, like kind of recommendations that we can come up with. And I think one of the strongest ones from this session is this definition of what mapping means. I mean, Omar, uh, Beth and I, and the others that were at our last meeting as we were putting together even just the translation of how do you translate the word map into Arabic so that it means what we won't intend it to mean because conventionally it's always been a physical map and so I think what what Superpool is doing and what Beth and Omar are doing is so so crucial to bring to the decision makers that mapping isn't just about the physicality about it it's about all these other layers that are so much more informative in decision making um, processes so I, I would like to say that this lesson learned is to take and redefine for practice, practices and education about what mapping uh, actually means. And myself as, a, as an educator, I'm kind of selfishly trying to get lessons for our own practice and teaching because there's this huge disconnect about what we teach and what, what should uh, be happening. We're actually now teaching our students, although it's a very formal kind of process, but we teach something like housing and GIS together. So they have that and Egypt actually has a very rich GIS infrastructure, but it's a question of accessibility and it's a question of making it public knowledge and available to practitioners. But I, what I what I'm seeing from this conference as well is this shift of practice. I was talking to Zaza and, and uh, Ahmed Burhan about that the other day of this kind of, and I don't know, maybe you can answer why this is, but now we have practitioners going out, defining problems, addressing the problem, and you have no client, from what I understand. There is no client, uh, t or the typical understanding of the client, uh, of how commissions were made to practices like yours in the past. That's changed just this past decade. I don't know if it's a phenomena of our economic crisis. There's no longer the money to have these big commissions made, if it's a lack of interest, if it's a, I don't know what it is, but that we have practitioners like you going out and saying, okay, here's a problem. <coughs> this is how we think we can at least document it. And then you go to the decision makers and present that. And that's such an interesting flip to how architectural practice and design research has been done up to only maybe a decade ago. So I would love to know how that came about. I mean, I know the four of you, it seems like kind of just a sense of responsibility to the environment that we are in and to take your, your, your know-how and volunteer it almost to the bigger community. But as a dynamic, I think it's really very fascinating and, and your thoughts on that would be great. Well, I think that's an important question, but before I answer that, I think I just want to go back to one of the points that Mohammed raised. I think one of the main distinctions between the work that Superpool is doing and we're do trying to do is um, the question of, a question of availability of um, our accessibility to information that Mohammed raised. Uh, so most of the quantitative analysis that we're doing requires access to a certain body of knowledge uh, statistical or otherwise, and then to individualize it into maps. Um, the other, the other difference is the the relevance of what we're, we're living in. We're 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 Beth and I are very interested to capture this very uh, ephemeral ephemeral moment, this this kind of fleeting moment that we think is gonna 
not going to last for long, and eventually many of these plaques are going to disappear. Once a new order is, is reestablished, so many of the street vans are going to be pushed back, many of the highway de uh, development, roadside development are going to be pushed back. Mm -hmm. So we really want to capture this moment, and that's why we're working mostly mm -hmm. on a street level, on the ground, and mm -hmm. we're less concerned at this particular moment, not that it's important, on the sort of looking at the global picture. So we're very interested to capture the things on the ground. Um, but um, but the question of, of, of legitimizing and and uh, is very important because to us, yeah, I mean, the street vendor example is very important. Yes, we don't have a client yet. Uh, my my question is for Almer and Beth. I was wondering the extent to which you think about your project as a pedagogical effort to raise awareness, and uh, if that if you do think of it that way, then who are the projected audiences, and to what extent do you have to develop the audiences and build the audiences and and how would you do that the question of the temporary or to some extent whether the government well i don't think the government sees informal areas as being permanent uh, or a lot of these things like microbuses they see them as an aberration uh, from some kind of an idealized future which is undefined um, and I think the inability to define or the, the absence of a definition of what is the desired end state um, it also affects the microbuses they're kind of seen as somehow even though they are the main source of transportation as being and they are registered sort of kind of uh, to to uh, as as being kind of by definition undesirable and therefore not needing to be documented or planned because in, in the back of their minds they think they're going to go away and be replaced by something else. But of course that's not true. <laughs> um, but I think that whole inability to think progressively what is the desired end state um, and, and not, not that it would ever be an end state, but I mean, what is the desired, what, what would you like to have in 20 or 30 years? You know, there would still be, obviously, continued evolution. But, but um, the inability to define that, or even assuming that ain't 2050, let's just all hope, um, that, that what is it? I mean, what, what is the standard that there should be, that should be tried to be installed with regard to public space and informal areas? Should the government stop thinking, for example, that agricultural land is going to somehow stay agricultural, even though that's obviously not going to happen uh, with the areas that are within a certain range of Cairo, um, and try to plan for public space and public facilities? Um, should there, there's, there doesn't need to be anything really done to plan microbus stops. I mean, what should the government be do? Is it possible for them to shift to thinking about this as being something that is not somehow temporary and violation of the quote unquote norm um, and, and actually deal with it? Or is that just unrealistic? as a muhafazin and so on, but you actually do nothing about it. Uh, so it creates this Chapter 22 situation where there's always a cause and a mission for the ministry and a budget here and a budget there and a project there and a project here, but on the ground nothing actually happens. And there has actually emerged a cottage industry. I mean, the amount of uh, consultants that work for the government, many of whom are from Egyptian universities, who, because the Egyptian university education system pays so little and they want to be, you know, important people, they have to find other ways to make money, so they become consultants, and they do projects. I mean, now there's this, the same people that were doing Cairo 2050 are now doing something called 712, and they do conferences all over the country. Uh, Rimel, I don't know, it's a very suspicious name to begin with. I mean, Rimel, if I'm wrong, it flies away. It's, I don't know, why would you call that anything? But, um, but anyway, it's a cottage industry. Proposals are being made hundreds of thousands of pounds are being spent on organizing conferences from many at ASU to whatever, and it's all building on hopes for the future. It's the idea of a vision. But it really doesn't come down to anything at all. Uh, so I think some people are benefiting from this state of flux, what Omar calls states of, a state of flux, just making it perpetual. It just goes on and on and on. Meanwhile, the city is functioning. People are building things. Microbuses are delivering uh, you know, bring transporting people. Uh, an economy that's completely out of outside of the tax code is happening. So yeah. Anyway, I just wanted to highlight that. I think it actually part of the function of the state. It has been, I think, in the last twenty to thirty years, to create this kind of negative discourse uh, without actually offering something positive to replace it. Partly because I do really believe that. Um, they have nothing to offer. I mean, if there was something true to offer as far as, let's, let's say, transport, 
they had many opportunities to do something about it. Um, so anyway. I just wanted to respond to the question about Quip and on how we envision it and who the audience is. I mean, just to say that when we, obviously, when we started developing it, the constituency was the initiatives themselves. And so our first objective was to create this tool for self-representation and for communication among the initiatives in um, Cairo. And so we're actually still working our way out of that. We've always kept an eye towards the public, and we've certainly designed it so that it can both be used by the public and also people who are not in the system can still add their events and things like this. But... Um, but we're still in that process of, uh, of un, sort of unrolling it and bringing people from that constituency into it and making sure that they know how to use it and making sure that it is a tool for them. And so, I mean, we've actually been very cautious. Even though the system has been live for a couple of weeks now, we haven't yet broadcast the URL because we want to first cultivate that community and then make it public. So I think the next phase for us is going to be addressing some of your questions. And we have been thinking about, you know, again, how... How is this perceived by a, a wider audience, but also what is our strategy for for reaching that wider audience? But I think that that's the next that's the next step for us. So we're being yeah. In other words, we're being very careful about making sure that this serves the community it's intended for first before addressing the the public. But uh, just to follow up on this, also to Karen and uh, Jennifer, uh, I think what we try to do. Now, this, what, this feeding moment is to quickly try to capture and document, document, document. We haven't, haven't, yet, we haven't had yet you know, time to have this kind of critical, reflective kind of luxury. So we're hoping that this database will allow us at, in the next stage is to not only make more analysis and connecting the visual and the spatial to the underlying political and social and economic processes, but also ultimately, and that goes back to your question and the question of norm, to try to derive new standards and new norms by looking at this informality as alternative modes of, of ordering principles. Whether we're talking about housing or street vendors or traffic, there are underlying structure, structure and principles that are just invisible. And people just dismiss it as ashway or, or, or random. It's not random whatsoever. And we've, we're partially doing that through courses you know, and, and workshops. Uh, so we started to develop like pattern, like we have another project called Learning from Informality based on the same theme. So what are the lessons we can learn from informal housing and informal use of public space that we can redefine the standards and norms, not only in terms of architecture, pedagogy, but also in terms of policy. So that's sort of a long-term project that we see this is only the stepping stone for it. Yeah. Uh, I will ask in Arabic. Um, we have seen more than the للرلاية الرسمية في النماذج اللي احنا شفناها دي ففي مثلا الباعة الجائلين في النسق العمراني اللي هو الإسكان الغير رسمي في النسق المواصلات المشكلة هنا احنا بنرجع للكلاينت زي ما الدكتور مجدة قال احنا لو عملنا توثيق لكل الانفورماليتي اللي بتحصل دي مين ايه الهدف منها يعني اذا اذا كان الهدف منها هو ان احنا يبقى عندنا معلومات تتيح امكانيه التطوير فهو مين اللي عنده امكانيه التطوير كان المفروض بقى الحكومه هي اللي تعمل التوثيق ده علشان تجهز خطه للتطوير او اذا كان في قطاع خاص ولا هيعمل ده او او اي شركات تطوير فعشان في عندها خطه مستقبليه للتطوير وعندها امكانيات لده لكن اذا كان توثيق المعلومه عشان نقدر كلنا نستفيد منها زي ان انا اعرف مكان الميكروباصات فين اعرف اقرب مسار ليا ايه فلازم اضمن ان المستخدمين عندهم طريقه وصول للانترنت فاحنا بنقول ان سكان المناطق الغير رسميه اكتر من 60% في القاهره هم بيستخدموا بيقدروا يدخلوا على الكمبيو بيقدروا يستخدموا الكمبيوتر ويستخدموا النت فهي القضيه ان احنا ممكن كده هنخلق جيتد كوميونتي برضو تاني باستخدام تكنولوجيا المعلومات هنبقى احنا بنستخدم الادوات بتاعتنا في ان احنا نعرف نوصل للمعلومه بطريقه يعني احسن شويه فهي دي هتبقى مشكله بس كمان عايزه اضيف حاجه احنا برضو عايزين ما نفضلش طول الوقت اللي جاي نعمل توثيق ونستهلك كل طاقتنا في التوثيق لازم نضمن طريقه تضمن استدامه ان المعلومه يحصل لها تحديث عشان كده لازم الكوميونتي هو اللي يعرف يعمل ده لوحده تخرج بره الاطار او بره قاعده المتخصصين بس like it's obvious there um but i was wondering also in terms of 
class and accessibility. Like, I mean, I really like this whole project on the website, but I also know why I like it. Like, I find it aesthetically appealing and all that. And I'm wondering about the accessibility. Um, I'd like to hear more about the the links you also made with like projects on the ground, like the women project in Diyarbakir, and you also mentioned the road ramp project like that. I mean, it makes, for me, it makes more, um, then this makes more sense in terms of, okay, this is this is a very nice, I mean, it's for communication, like for the campaigns itself and for the institutions, but then again, um, it addresses people like us, right? And so apart from... We, we also need it. Yeah, of course we also need it. Like, it, I'm not, this, this is not a critique, it's not a judgment, nothing. Just like, um, I'd like to hear if, like a li little bit more about the links actually to projects on the ground. Well, maybe I have just a question to add. Um, we do a lot of work um, in areas in Latin America and also in other parts of Asia and I know that a lot of these communities already have embedded within them strong cultural um, uh, organizations and a lot of them also already have their own Facebook pages, they have their own websites, they already do a lot of self-propagation. There was one community that we worked with in Bangkok, like a pretty poor informal settlement, but at the same time they were actually raising money to send to Japan after the earthquake and tsunami. So I think that there already are latent within these communities, these really strong networks. So if something like this or something like these mappings could just tap into an already existing infrastructure, then they kind of self... These existing networks... We already have these existing networks that are really easy to tap into, so maybe that's also how we can begin to discuss the idea of mapping, or as we call critical mapping, because like you say, it's not just visible layers, but it's the invisible networks that you begin to overlay, and how you begin to translate this critical mapping into kind of reality. Because I think ultimately we are people who want to do things, like everybody is saying, so maybe this becomes a step where we can talk about how we actually now learning from Cairo to develop the city. I think for that, as Omar also once mentioned, there's two different stages. I mean, there's the one documentation stage, which was, like for us, mapping Istanbul was just a documentation. There was no real conclusions from it. We, we just needed to have that data to start working in Istanbul. That was that was basically it. And the Dormish Minibus map started off as, okay, we, we there's no maps. We need to navigate ourselves and, you know, we need to start learning the city. So let's just put it together for ourselves to learn it. But the public outreach side, it's really a, a, it's a lot more effort than you would ever imagine it is. I mean, we over the summer we tried to run a campaign on Taksim, Taksim Square, and it was just basically an online uh, platform where you could type in your ideas what it should be. We had a very beautiful little movie that said, you know, what, what is, and it was as a cartoon, so it was really accessible. And it just asked, you know, what, what do you think should be the future of Taksim? And to get any serious response to that, was almost impossible. Like we, it just didn't really happen. Uh, so, to, to and we were advised by the um, basically that we have to have how many? It was ten ten thousand followers on Facebook to have any discussion possible. Mm. So, for an architecture office of our size to really try to campaign to have ten thousand followers. Is, is a lot of work. Uh, and at that moment you st start sort of thinking, where, where should I put my priority? If I have these skills of putting something out that maybe didn't exist before, should I just keep on doing that? And hopefully then uh, along the way there's some alliances that form that then take on the propaga propagation side. Uh, yeah, so I mean that that's kind of has been our, our decision, you know, okay, we, we will we will do what we do best, and hopefully along the way we, we figure out how to... But it's also, you have to have some conclusions. I mean, we, we didn't get to the moment of having conclusions in a way. Uh, I mean, we, we are surveying, and uh, yes, we could make a very practical sort of helpful de device for uh, mapping uh, um, for, for the dormish or the, or, the, or the buses or whatnot. 
but again, that's that's just making a practical tool. It's not really making a real vision of anything or kind of offering any real solution. It's uh, still still creating practical tools. Yeah, just going back to Hannah's question. Yani, you were part of this project, so you should answer yourself. But one of the projects that we tried to do uh, last year was this open street map system. I will hang out and I'll give the mic back to you. Uh, yeah, and one of the things we try to do is to create this uh, uh, map, open street map system. The people, as I said, um, map their own services and amenities that they found for themselves um, necessary and relevant to their communities. Not only infrastructure, but you know, micro bus stops and pharmacy and so on. And we came with the idea, and actually, Hannah is part of this project. You maybe talk about it. Is to to develop a system like almost a Afin um, Sakaya, the Ramadan calendar. So something like that that has a map of the neighborhood on one side and in the back you have a list of pharmacies or a list of doctors or a list of you know hospitals or so on and so forth. And then each one of these enterprises will pay a certain fee so have their names being advertised and return it gets reproduced and it's actually create jobs. So it becomes sort of an organic system that people find it profitable to do these small things. So it disseminates knowledge, it's accessible, and it's actually more sensitive to people's needs. And maybe Anna, the habit of the الأول المنطقة اللي حصلت فيها الورشة هي منطقة أرض اللواء دي المكان اللي أنا ساكنة فيه اللي الورشة دي كانت علشان تمكننا من طريقة نقدر نوصل بيها لتجميع معلومات من غير ما أكون متخصص فتعمل اتعملت مجموعة من من أكتر من جمعية من المنطقة ومن الأحزاب السياسية ومن الأفراد الفعالين كل ده عشان يكون مجموعة تضمن استدامة الرفع ده اللي احنا بناخده بنتعلمه فبعد ما تعلمنا التكنيك ده او الطريقة دي اللي هي اني استخدم الجي بي اس في اني اوثق معلومة زي مكان سيدالية مكان سلم مكان جامع مكان كنيسة ايا كانت المعلومة دي وابدأ ادخلها على ال حاجة كده وسط ما بين الأوبن ستريت ماب وما بين الجي بي اس بحيث ان اقدر اعدل على المعلومات دي طبقا للواقع او المكان بتاعي وبعد كده برفعها بحيث ان المتاحة لكل الناس ان هم يشوفوها واي حد تاني بعديها يقدر يعدل مكانها اذا حصل حاجة يعني اذا المحل ده اتقفل وتفتح نشاط تاني فممكن حد يدخل ويعدل ده يكتب اسم شارع بعد ما اخدنا الورشة دي فكرنا ان احنا ازاي ممكن نستغل ده فحبينا نكمل الرفع قلنا احنا عايزين نقسم الرفع بتاعنا ان احنا نرفع خدمات صحية خدمات تعليمية ايا كانت كل الخدمات اللي موجودة في المنطقة الفرص اللي موجودة محلات فاضية الشقة اللي موجودة كل ده يترفع اسماء الشوارع بس هو في في قضية تانية ان احنا عشان نرفع ده ونحطه على النت احنا عارفين ان مش كل سكان ارض الله يقدروا يدخلوا على النت فان ممكن نعمل حاجة وسط يبقى في مطبوعات يبقى فيها الخريطة ان انا هقدم حاجة زي كده دي اسمها الخريطة الصحية الأرض اللي هو فيها كل الصيدليات والعيادات ومراكز التحاليل والمراكز الطبية بحيث ان اي حد في البيت يبقى معاه معاه زي فارس في المنطقة أقدر وأنا في البيت عندي حالة طوارئ عايزة أعرف مين أقرب دكتور جنبي فعلى طول هعرف رقم أعرف الصيدلية اللي مفتوحة دلوقتي فدي هتبقى خدمة بسيطة باستخدام التكنولوجيا دي في نفس الوقت أقدر أوفر لهم لينك عشان يعرفوا أكتر يدخلوا أكتر على باقي الخرائط ممكن نضيف عليها مجموعة خدمات زي اللي نتكلم عن مشاكل المنطقة بس عشان أنا أعمل المنتج ده مين مين ممكن يشتريه أنا عايزة أوفره ب مجانا اصلا يعني فبتبدأ تدخل قضية تانية ان انا عايزة اعمل ايه ايه ففكرنا ان احنا محتاجين نزود جزء التسويق او جزء دعاية قلنا طيب ما هو كمان ممكن نضيف حاجة تانية يعني ممكن نستغل فكرة اللي في كنت قريت في أبحاث في مشاركة استخدام المسؤولية الاجتماعية للشركات في حاجة مستفزة بتحصل الأيام دي شوف إكس فاكتور وعرب أيدل وكل الشركات الكبيرة بترعى حاجة مش أولوية بالنسبة لنا إحنا كعالم عربي إزاي نقدر ندخل مفهوم زي ده للمناطق دي كلها نقول لهم إن لا في في القاهرة 60% بالأمور يعني في عندك زبون 
يعني في الشركات اللي هي زي ممكن برسين ممكن اريال كل دول كلاين بتاعهم اصلا في المناطق دي ازاي بربط فكره التنميه مع التسويق ويبقى قريب من الناس فالنموذج النموذج بيتطور لكن الاساسيات بتاعته ان انا ببني قاعده في في المكان بعلمهم تكنيك بضمن استدامه ماليه وبضمن استدامه في التنميه وبرمي النموذج ده وبنقي لمنطقه ثانيه والهدف هو مش اني اعمل ربح بس الهدف اني اضمن الوصول للمعلومه واني اوفر قاعده بيانات واني احقق كل المفاهيم السياسيه الرئيسيه زي الديمقراطيه وزي تمكين المجتمع فهو ده احنا بنحاول نبنيه بس الموضوع مش 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 سهل يعني <تصفيق> في نقطة مهمة قوي انه وانت بتحكي على فكرة الفهرس حسيت ان احنا بنتكلم على فكرة الفون بوك وده كان موجود في مصر الفون بوك ده كان كتاب طيب بس آه عشان ما تضيعش وقت انا بس آه الفون بوك آه حاجه موجوده لسه في انحاء آه العالم وكانت موجوده في مصر وفيها فعلا جزء رئيسي لا اي هاف فروم فروم يعني من البحث بتاعي آه في فون بوكس ديتيلد بطريقه انا ما شفتهاش بره معلش يعني ده واقع آه بكل حاجات عاده ما بتبقاش ليستد في في, في الانترناشونال ستاندرد اوف فون بوكس وده بيعكس نوع من برضه سنس اوف كوميونيتي الاوربن بيس سنس اوف كوميونيتي اللي كان موجود لفتره ما لحد الستينات في هتلاقي كتاب بيطلع كل سنه آه في نمر التليفونات طبعا وبعدين في الاخر في اعلانات بتاع الشركات اللي صرفة على الكتاب والكتاب كان ببلاش فده كان موجود لحد الستينات آه اختفاء ده جزء منه يرجع لفكره المابنج وفكره المعلومات يعني قصدي عشان الكتاب ده يتعمل لازم يبقى في ناس واعيه وبتشتغل تبع المؤسسه على فكره وزاره الاتصالات اللي بتعمله مش مش انيشيتيف آه انديفيجوال الدولة هي اللي بتعمله فهو ده الجزء برضه لاختفاء الدولة ومسؤوليتها من الحالات دي. الجزء اللي انت بتقوليه بتاع الاعلانات ودخول الشركات الكبيرة ده مهم جدا لانه ده برضه شكر ناقص والجزء الكبير منه انه المناطق الكبيرة السوق لو نتكلم عليها كسوق اتس انفيزبل يعني هو مش الشركات مش شايفاه هم مش شايفين ان هو ده السوق بتاعه هو عارف ان هو بيعمل منتج وهيعمل كمية معينة وبتتوزع في موزعين انما الديتا الاوربن بيس داتا بتاعت السوق الكونسومرز فين وهي ده هياثر لو كانت المعلومات دي متاحه ومابت هياثر على اصلا الشركات مش بس الدوله بت ازاي بتعمل البوليسيز بتاعتها بس الشركات ازاي بت بتارجت اتس كلاينتس وبتلينك بقى الافكار اللي انت بتقوليها الديفلوبمنت لان ده بنشوف بنشوفه في اماكن ثانيه اند سم تايمز سكسسفول يعني فهو كله مرتبط برضه بفكره المابنج بس جزيره فسهله الواحد يحط لها اولها واخرها انما في مناطق تانية احنا مش عارفين في المنطقة بتخلص والتانية بتبدأ فالسنس اوف كوميونيتي اصلا اللي بيست اون ات هنعمل بوليسيز وهنعمل تداول معلومات وتداول المعلومات ده هيوصل لحالات تانية ضايع شوية فانا بفكر ان جزء من المابنج اللي يمكن نمشي من المؤتمر ده ونشجعه هو مابنج للنيبر هودز بطريقة على الارض واقعية مش المابنج بتاع النيبر هودز حسب ما الدولة في خريطة الانتخابات حطاها which means actually في في ديسكونكت ما بين الخريطة دي والواقع فايوه فدي حالات نتكلم فيها برضه. احنا مثلا في ارض اللواء لما نيجي هقول بس في في النقطه دي حاجه لما بشوف الخريطه اللي عاملاها هيئه التخطيط العمراني لارض اللواء بنلاقيها مختلفه عن اللي الناس عارفه ارض اللواء بيه يعني هم حاطين ليها حدود وفي بقى يعني في في تحيز مثلا لو في حوض مش موجود في الهيئه بي بيقول لا احنا احنا ارض اللواء يعني الحوض ده احنا الحدود بتاعت ارض اللواء من كذا لكذا فهو فعلا في حدود لكل منطقه حدود شعبيه غير الحدود الرسميه او الدوليه. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I have another um, good morning everybody. So I have another issue that I would love to just uh, to put on the table because um, we really appreciate the effort of, of Omar and Beth and of Mali Brashi and of course Mohammed and um, I'm just thinking about the reprodu reproducibility of these things because you are not sleeping since um, since the revolution maybe to do this mapping 
and to do this work. And uh, as I teach her, like Magda, I'm trying to get the best, uh, the best for my job. And I see that, um, of course, we have. I don't want to be. Too, so, well, we have the formality, which brings money. And we have the informality, maybe, which bring money, but in another sense. And so the universities are preparing the, the next generation to get money, so to work for the formality. So there is big, this big gap about what is happening in the city and what we are teaching at the university. I see for the application that we are receiving for our summer schools, the 98% they are still presenting application with some compounds in the desert. So the project that they are doing is kind of something coming from somewhere else. So not connected to the to the city at all. So a topic that I would love to put on the table here to discuss with you is what we can do, we as teacher and uh, halfway professional, to get a little bit this informality into our formal words of university, or a better way around, how to get the students to get to know and to work. Uh, for or against or to map or whatever. I think we, we should think about a way to, to, to link together these two, two institutions. Have people involved with education and we seem to be finding a lot of disconnects. I mean, if there's anything we can come up with from this debate is where those disconnects are and what we can do to reconnect them. So education and practice, um, informal, if you want to call yourselves informal practice and conventional kind of client commission competition practice and to reconnect that top and bottom. Lindsay was talking a little bit about their work as being like the hinge between the top down and the bottom up and how does that work when right now we don't have a top or who is the top or the top that we have now may change tomorrow morning and, and the bottom isn't prepared to discuss anything with the top and we have these dynamics that are so interesting. So as educators, we need to respond in what kind of architects do we want our students to be. And I agree with you completely. We've been catering for the, the SOMs of the world up till this point to produce um, construction document machines that can prepare a full package and deliver it to a client on time and that's that's what we are, we're doing unfortunately as much as we may not agree with it so I think we need if we can come up and I'm trying to take notes but if we can come up with a redefinition of what an architect can be and I think Salva and Gregor's uh, uh, example of the laundromat is an ingenious one because it's the architect as like an undercover agent you're trying to deliver a service that is not looked positively upon and get to women that are battered and killing themselves by designing a laundromat and I think that's ingenious so this diff this well this or part of it uh, this, just this idea of the architect is someone that can deliver service in an unconventional way. I think we really need as educators to redefine what architects can be. Yep. Um, yeah, I think just uh, following the same point, I agree that, I mean, the first stage would be like the demystification of informality because it's still like a very big black box. I think one of the try to do with this conference and many other people are trying to do is to try to open up this area to make it accessible to a larger audience, practitioners and academics and politicians. But I think I also want to be very, you know, realistic about this question of change in the pedagogy because it takes much more than, you know, a couple of faculty who are, you know, breaking new grounds. I think this is institutional vested interest in this kind of status quo. And it has to do with many things, with formal practice. That's it's it's gonna take much more. It's like saying, you know, revolution happened, so it's gonna have like, you know, the bureaucracy is gonna be different. No, the bureaucracy has been there for many, many years. The status quo is much, very, very strong, and it's gonna take a lot of structural change to allow for this alternative mode of learning. And you know, we tried with some of the people in the audience to introduce courses on formality, and it was, you know it was met with huge resistance. And you know we all know why that is, because there's already kind of established orthodoxy in any institution, academic or otherwise, that is not easy to change this. Uh, so I myself tried to work in smaller universities at the outskirts of the margin, at the geographical margin, to allow for this kind of guerrilla styles undercover without anybody noticing it. And maybe eventually it's gonna pick up and get, you know, get the attention. But if you try to hit the center, it's, it's not easy. 
So I think we need also to be realistic about power relations. It's not just about great ideas. It's about like the structure. Just I thought of another useful map that we haven't discussed that's not about the city that actually relates to what Marda was saying. If maybe, and this data you should be able to have uh, whether a GUC or AUC or a Tri University, someone from there, is to actually map where the market is for the students that graduate. Because something tells me that will say a lot about uh, who, is, who is it the university invests in so much for. And mm -hmm. quite often, the market for them to work is not here. I mean, they go to work somewhere else, often in the Gulf. I mean, when I went to visit Dubai, we always hear about the, uh, uh, the labor uh, from the subcontinent. And of course, the designers with the big names who come from the US or Europe. But the middle ranks of the actual um, engineers who have the shop drawings, who are implementing, everyone I saw was Egyptian, and everyone was in their 20s. And they all graduated from Cairo um, or Alexandria or you know some of the other big cities with the architecture schools in Egypt. So we're actually providing, I mean, a huge supply for a market elsewhere. And of course, because they're Egyptian, they get paid a little bit less than their European or American counterparts uh, for that position. So anyway, so I think mapping that data would actually be useful for us to revisit what Egyptian academia is doing, because maybe this is why the status quo is so powerful. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'll add something just very to go to that UNESCO meeting when we were in the midst of organizing all of this. One of the things that's just a little bit hopeful is UNESCO is um, sponsoring an uh, international initiative to address architectural education. And it doesn't have a lot of legislative power, but it is a body that's international. It operates in 130 countries to kind of just softly recommend and, and advise architectural education on its trajectory uh, and that is really shifting. I mean, one of the things that we discussed and I presented there was what's happening like this Learning from Cairo conference. And it amazes me, and I was talking to Lindsay about this as well, that um, the North or the West are more concerned and more aware of the problems that we are facing. So to get that, so there is hope that the the this formal kind of structural um, things are changing towards uh, our direction, we hope. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I, I think that the, the, there actually is more presence um, of the use of the internet, of course, among the younger generation, uh, and it varies from area to area within the informal areas, obviously. Um, I did a study, um, you know, uh, sort of after the revolution, um, looking at the popular committees, and, and which were universal. Everybody had a popular committee. I mean, any, uh, any, any guys here, I'm sure they were part of their local popular committee. Um, and um, one of the things that was very evident was that, that the Facebook presence of youth groups and other things was very strong in the Giza side, in Mbaba. I mean, I started, first I started searching for, you know, Ligan Shabaya and seeing what kind of Facebook sites had that, um, and then searching for um, the Shabab, the youth group, Shabab Mbaba, Shabab Faisal, Shabab Marg, et cetera, Shabab something or other, youth, youth of so-and-so place. Um, and tons of stuff in Mbaba, tons of stuff in general on that side, nothing. Um, nothing in Haganna. Some things in Dar es Salaam, sort of, kind of, um, but not much. And I'm really wondering, in, with regard to the social structure, of whether it's a function of these villages, because Mbaba is seeded with villages. Um, and you can find, you know, these youth groups in youth self-identified youth groups, and of course they could call themselves something besides Shabab, uh, you know, Koma, whatever. Um, but uh, who knows? I can't guess. Um, but there, there actually is a lot of use, and and so there, there, those things are out there. Um, and uh, you also have things like Wikimapia, which I love. I love Wikimapia, um, which is uh, a wiki on top of a Google platform, Google Earth platform. And, and if you look through the country, you'll see people all over the place have identified their village and their farm and so forth and put all kinds of information in it. So there, there, are, there, there is the potential to, to have these things be used. And alternatively, another way that you could do it, I mean, you cannot walk through an informal area down the commercial streets without running into like 10 Vodafone outlets. 
or ten it is a lot or you know they're, they're the ones who are the most present of anyone in terms of the the only role I wouldn't say the only that's probably too strong but but one of the very few sort of corporate um, you know oil slick uh, crowd um, that's present in the informal areas now those obviously are are they're they're they're, kiosk, they're not they're not uh, owned by the companies but they could be nonetheless outlets uh, to display information even if you can't afford to you know in printed form um, even if you can't and maybe it would attract them some customers and stuff you could print something and have it be available for consultation without having it be in every home um, and and things like that might might be might be possible there could be ways that some of those companies could be involved um, but there but so I mean I think there are ways to get the information out there uh, the last thing I wanted to say is that there are some very interesting experiences from from India and elsewhere of having the communities I think you guys did some of that having the communities map themselves um, as a way of organizing the community and generating information um, and I think I know you guys are experimenting with that but there does seem to be a lot of potential there. Um, ideally, if there's some payoff for them uh, in, in terms of some project that's going to happen or some response to their to gaps that are identified. I, I would like to add to that in maybe some other sources of information. I don't know if it's relevant or not. But I just want to sort of propose them. Uh, again, the newspapers could be interesting for if we're both the word count of neighborhoods that get mentioned. Also, I don't know if there's re any rental postings. It could be interesting to, to track down the sort of prices that are uh, being suggested. Mm. Uh, we, we, we have this project still in pipe sort of to do for Istanbul to look, kind of make a land value map because it's, this doesn't exist and it's a very crucial map to see. Uh, even if it's only one district to look at, maybe we won't be able to do the whole of Istanbul, but just to uh, almost uh, gather that from the online postings. Uh, job postings could be interesting. I don't know if there's any platforms that uh, architecture students or other in, in, in general uh, job seekers look for. I would imagine for the black market that probably doesn't make much sense. And but uh, the schools must have data, uh, primary schools must have data of their students. I don't know if they would be willing to share, but it's definitely, they're usually the easier one to approach than any other. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it looks desperately to me like you would need to find a density map somehow, and I, I don't know, uh, some, some sort of FIR and density map. But, can't really figure out how you would find the data for that without having governmental support. And There was one uh, interesting initiative. There was one interesting initiative by a newspaper after the revolution. Al Watan is a, is a newspaper that came out only after the revolution, and they had a, 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 an online under website map uh, with places to f to find parking in the city, which I thought was amazing. I've never seen anything like this for Cairo before. I don't know if, if you've seen it, but you can actually late click on the the where the parking space is, and then it tells you the hours, and it tells you if you have to pay or not, and how much you have to pay, and this, uh, the <laughs> I'm sorry? <laughs> no, they didn't have that, but uh, but as, as a potential, it's there. I think this was a very, I mean, a very basic. You need to have a map of where you can park, and that will determine where you will draw. Okay, but this question or that, like, with this... It's actually very important to this, the question we're asking, Yanni. Some of this formal mapping almost become irrelevant, like the Lili telephone, the phone index, or you know the information, because the formal part of the city is almost getting a formalized. So that's why all these projects we're trying to introduce, trying to find alternative way for accounting for these practices that are completely excluded from the formal census, the formal mapping from this. But I think the parking is a great project to, yeah. And also, why, one question from my side, why, why didn't you do the uh, time lapse from a higher place? Uh, or did you, or did you do it? Higher meaning like airplane or? <laughs> <laughs> Just pick one of the kind of uh, tall, tall towers and put a camera up. You want to answer that? Uh, well, I mean, we basically choose the places we have access to. So a lot of the, a lot of the time lapse we did from our space and our friends balcony and our friends friends with our small informal network it's very very hard to ask somebody to put a camera we actually once did the um, the mistake of putting a camera we asked a shop to put the camera in their display window 
and leave it for one day to see what's happening there in front. Well, there's a mosque, so how people come and put prayer in. And he was very hospitable, and that's great. And then the next day, they, my colleagues in the office went to pick up the, and they almost got arrested because they were thought as spies. And you guys were counting the tiles. Who are you? And I, I, went, I, I had to bring a letter from the university, and they didn't accept it. I had to go to the police, to, all the way to the Ministry of Interior. So people are very, very suspicious of anybody. What kind making, of camera are you using? It's a very simple little time-lapse camera. It's very. It's, it's it, like a it, plant camera. It doesn't even look like. A it camera. looks like a toy, actually. It's yeah. very, but uh, but it looks like very, you know. Anyway, so my my point is, it's it's easier to try to use the network that you have instead of like app approaching people say I'm going to do mapping because people are no, very no, suspicious. I mean, with in the network, isn't there? Yeah, yeah we, we, <laughs> we'll try it, yeah. We'll work on that. Thanks. Um, actually, even just what you were saying, it would be great to have an account of the process that you went through um, from having been arrested, how you negotiated your way around that. And um, that as a kind of guide, maps are also like guides. And I think they're useful. The question of audience is really important because who they're useful for. In some areas, you don't need a map because you know it. And so the people who live there don't really need that that knowledge unless you come in as an intruder who you are whether you're suspect whether you're an Israeli spy or not any of those things come into question um, so I think this is a great initiative what you're doing I'm very excited about it and it also gives the possibility for finding out what fantasies we might have so I have a fantasy of mapping um, military clubs across um, <laughs> <laughs> Actually, AUC gave me time. AUC gave me time off to do it. I've got it in writing. Um, <laughs> I'm going to continue with it. And what I was wondering was whether you can facilitate that or help um, people to do that, to envision things that you can connect together. Another thing for the education was um, maybe recycling points where we could arrange with Boabin to work out different spots or ways that they can work with residents. And I don't know if that's some kind of um, new age fantasy or something. I don't know what it is, but it... I mean, I mean, this is actually an interesting point that you raised, that there are existing infrastructures that could be used uh, in subversive ways, I suppose, for the purposes of, of research and uh, data or mapping or whatever. I mean, the, the Bawabin example is an obvious one because that was a fundamental tool for the security state. I mean, Bawabs were informants. So maybe they can now spread information about where to be more efficient about, I don't know, something that has to do with the urban forum itself. I don't know. Um, I just have something quick to say with regards to both the mapping and the education. Um, we teach, um, I come from Switzerland, where we teach all of our studios on informality specifically. Um, and I think that students are actually a great resource to which you can get a lot of these mappings and this information out of. And I know that Studio Basel a few years ago actually very like, thoroughly mapped all of Cairo. I think they produced like 10 books. And you know, this is something that could very easily come out of your own universities. So maybe it's not so much if there's logistical issues, maybe it's more about understanding the city first, which is maybe a gateway then to allow you to work into these informal areas. Because um, it is, a, I think, a huge task to begin to map a city. And students, they're excited. They want to know about where they're from. We find that you know, our students are actually capable of mapping much more with much more intensity than any government institution. You know, we're working in Trinidad and they have really no information about their own city. Our students went within like five months, and within five weeks they had produced like a dossier of information that, you know, we showed local community members and they were totally just baffled that this, is act this actually existed. So I think finding a way to link the academic with the mapping could actually create a, a really unique platform. Can I, can I ask a question? Uh, one of the things when I first got introduced to your work that fascinated me, but I don't think it came across in the discussion, maybe it wasn't intended, or maybe it's a fantasy, is like th the way you're visualizing and simplifying and making accessible 
this technical information, mostly urban issue information to the wider public, public could be actually very important in terms of a country that undergoing a process of democratization. So people voting on issues like, you know, who's going to be the president, like, you know, fuel, bread, but they also need to take into account the issues of transportation and real estate value and some of the issues. So by making this technical information accessible and simple to wider public, you're actually creating more of urban democracy, or we're contributing to that, potentially. And I don't know if that's something that you know, could potentially be part of Cairo. Like People need to know about that their area is actually had a very high value, or their area has not only one bakery, or their area has one bus stop, or this kind of thing. So. I mean, obviously that was the hope, but I think we should also recognize the limitations of an architect, right? I mean, I mean, we 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 can do some things, and we can kind of put a spark in there and say, okay, look at this. This is what we could find. But uh, I mean, usually many of our projects then take on and inspire other people to do other things. So, I mean, we can do the initial, let's say, kick, and then it kicks, uh, takes on, right? Now we have done also bicycle maps for for inner Istanbul and say, okay, look at the here the topography is actually over you can overcome it if you plan your route and but right now there's a i mean you think istanbul you cannot bike but you can actually bike if you plan your route um, but this has and then we give it out and it will take its own life and uh, so uh, yeah so far. this uh, this new project we have with uh, having a half a page in uh, this popular sort of street magazine this uh, comic magazine is is for us the new outlet we've only been doing it for two months to tomorrow is actually our deadline for the third month uh, where we will have the bike map uh, reworked and part of the thing is I think we are working with the uh, graphic designers who are actually are much better than ourselves in in, uh, in communicating information I mean the original bus map uh, bike map we did wasn't so legible it was very clear to us, but it didn't really mean maybe so much to uh, really uh, just just anyone on the street. So now we are having, you know, taking the time to work together with a graphic designer. She's she's very sort of sweet in her language. It's uh, you know, she uses a lot of almost uh, it's sweet uh, uh, iconography and whatnot to to really enrich it to make it a more communica communicative. Uh, Piece. And this is quite useful. Also, a lot uh, on our presentation on uh, Friday, uh, all the cartoons. Uh, again, it was together with a visual artist. I mean, he he drew it. We animated them. We worked with a Korean sound uh, uh, designer to really put it all together. But all of these, of course, I mean, you you learn it along the way because no, you know, we didn't really learn about this at school. But, uh, but communication part of it is as as important, and sometimes somehow we're not really trained in that, and we just to acknowledge that we are not, and to work with the correct professionals is important. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, since there is a translator, so I prefer to ask the question in Arabic. So please put on your headphone. شفت اللي انتوا عملتوه يعني ربطتوا باللي معمول قبل كده بمثلا كتاب نويفرت او تايم سيفر انا شايف ان هي هي نفس الفكره بس لما حد بيجي يبني حاجه في مصر او يعني معماريين او مخططين عمرانيين او حاجه كده بيمشوا على القوانين بتاعت نويفرت اللي هي ممكن ما تمشيش على ال على الكونديشنز بتاعت مصر وبيمشوا على الكود البناء المصري اللي هو فيه ممكن يعتبر مثلا حربة حاجات بقى بالتورز بتاعت امبارح ممكن مثلا يعتبر التاور الكبير اللي كان في ميدان مصطفى محمود اللي كله كيرتن وول متقفل بإزاز في الواجهة الغربية والواجهة الجنوبية ده فورمال بس يعتبر كشك على ناصية شارع كشك شغال كويس جدا يعتبره انفورمال ف يعني ليه بقى ما ما, ما تخلوش ما يعني ما المابينج بتاعكم ده ما يروحش على الكود البناء او يروح للحاجه الحكوميه يبقى هو ده اللي المفروض الناس تبني بيه بدل ما دلوقتي احنا اه قاعدين نبني في مدن جديده بس المدن الجديده ماشيه على الرولز بتاع مش بتاعه مصر رولز بره او او حاجات مش بتنفع في مصر ف مثلا واحد ساكن في الشيخ زايد عشان يشتري خضار هيركب عربيته ويروح ربع ساعة مثلا لغاية هايبر 1 يشتري خضار ويقف نص ساعة في طابور عشان يحاسب ويروح 
انا ساكن في مهندسين جنب نادي الصيد بشتري خضار ازاي في راجل ساكن في بولاء اسمه عم حمدي بيجي بعربيه كارو كل يوم يجي تحت البيت يضرب انتركام يقول عايزين خضار يا باشا اه اتفضل ماشي خلاص بشتري منه كده فانا بالنسبه لي انا ده اللي ده الفورمال وانفورمال اللي ساكن في الشيخ زايد اللي بيعمل كل ده ف ليه بقى ما تخلوش في الرولز يعني ليه ليه ما تعرضوش على الحكومه الماب المابس بتاعتكم طب انا عايزه اضيف على على اللي, اللي انت كنت بتقوله وكمان كنت عايزه اسال سوبر بول سؤال في اول سؤال للسوبر بول يمكن سؤال تافه او بسيط or, uh, but I just want to know like how uh, you managed to to do the the maps مثلا for the bikes um, did, were you commissioned by the government was it uh, a gallery that commissioned you uh, were you funded by uh, USAID were you, you know like uh, because this really um, is an important thing um, in this context where um, it's, it's difficult to produce this material and it's the reality um, and that brings me actually to a second point um, which we've all been talking about kind of and, and beating around, which is who is the audience for the maps? Uh, do they have agency in, in producing their own information? Um, what is the point of the map? Blah, blah, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, uh, for, for example, for me, um, the usefulness of a microbus map in Cairo is uh, less so for the users, actually, um, uh, ironically speaking, um, but more so for, for the government. And uh, therefore, if I were to, to, to make such a map, uh, my idea would be to, to present it, to pitch it to the government as, look at these um, amazing entrepreneurs um, that have created uh, value um, and and you know infrastructure that you know uh, and it's normal. I mean, in Japan, if you look at the metro system in Japan, uh, it was all developed privately. Uh, it's all private uh, companies that created these uh, metro lines. If you look at the train system in the U.S., um, that was also uh, due to transportation of meat, actually, um, and it was also private, and then it became uh, governmental. So a lot of the times it's entrepreneurs that are trying to, uh, you know, fill a gap that come up with solutions. And so the idea would be to show, okay, look at the income generated by a microbus. I'm going to map how much money this microbus makes per day, and that's not being taxed. Um, and I mean, this goes to the Soto and, and all that, those kind of arguments. But if I make a map showing, okay, these are the routes, they're really great, uh, they're there. But also, look how much money this is, this is making. I know I hate to sound like such a, a capitalist, but that's, I mean, to try to find the means to, to address uh, the issue in creative ways so that it becomes somehow, um, mainstream or formalized or accepted. So that's why it's important to think of the audience. Whereas with the bicycle map, I think it's more useful for someone like me or, or someone like Muhammad or someone who actually really wants to use the bikes because with the microbuses in Egypt at least, a lot of the users know uh, intuitively how to navigate the system. Once you uh, become a user, I, I, I've, I, I, I am a user of, of, of them sometimes and you start to know where to go, what to do. Like So it's less useful for me but for me to know a biking route is, is somehow uh, more useful in a city such as Cairo where it's very difficult to navigate so knowing your audience really uh, can provoke I think uh, interesting or different ways I know revenue streams sound so like uh, you know I, it shouldn't be like that but but it could be a, a positive way to to address these issues yeah. Anyhow, so uh, let's say uh, how long a map takes to make. I mean, we, we uh, the bike map in particular, we, we did it completely out of just just for fun. We had uh, we were in between jobs. We something we didn't need to start really in until a month. So we had one person who didn't have anything to do, and we said, okay, why don't we just do a map instead of doing a competition? Because architects actually work for free a lot. We we do a lot of competitions in general. So we said, okay, let's stop. Uh, we had a choice. We said we won't do the competition. Let's do something that, uh, in any case, 
we won't make any money from the competition, we'll, we'll do the map. Uh, and it was one, one month of uh, one junior ar architect and a, and a student. Um, we weren't going to fire her anyway, so it's like just, just to, you know, there's always gaps in the workflow, so we always sort of capitalize on the uh, gaps that we have to do other things that we would like to do. Uh, so it's a very bad business plan, but it's just kind of, uh, in, in any way, it's in how architects typically work. Uh, instead of doing competitions, we do these things. Uh, the, the bike map, uh, in essence, was more actually... Uh, theoretical than the minibus map uh, because the, the bike lanes don't exist. It's actually just to point out that these are areas you could put bike lanes. So, so it was actually more directed towards the authorities than the minibus map. And, and, and it's, it's obvious you first kind of have a point you want to make. You make the map and then you slowly start seeing where, where other platforms it makes sense to put it. But, you know, limit the work of a map to one month or two weeks or something so it's actually doing Otherwise, it becomes projects that are not doable. But uh, actually, there the story is that uh, right now they will not go into making bike lanes because they're thinking that the public opinion is such that they should solve bigger problems before doing bike lanes. But it's in the works, or they are thinking, of course, that far. But so in some ways, it's a little bit premature. <laughs> but at the same time, it, it got its own life in the media. Like we sent it to newspapers, and, and so we do our own like uh, dissemination, mm -hmm. but without going, let's say, to start selling it or distributing it. You can download it from our website, but it actually took quite a long while. Yeah. It actually has had a quite a kind of popular reaction to it from very different kinds of people. Uh, every every two weeks, we get a phone call and say, "Can I have the map?" And then there's uh, different bike organizations who want to collaborate with us because just recently, Gregor's was interviewed by the Danish TV uh, on the bike map issue. Ooh, they were Turkish Danish. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, then the funny thing was that they were expecting Gregor's to be riding a bike. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm very disappointed. Oh, you arrive in your limousine. Here come uh, just, a, uh, just a quick response to Manal, and then I want to address the uh, gentleman. Uh, I, I agree with you that you need to find a way to engage the government to, en you know, entice them to work with this, and maybe, you know, taxation would be a good, although a bit, I would be a little wary of like you know, destroying already existing and viable economic by system by introducing sort of, um, you know, superimposed taxes. But, but I think also I'm very interested in open up, even if microbus current microbus users. Uh, are already aware and familiar with the routes that you don't need a map. But I'm just actually encouraging non-users. So I, I'm, I'm very, I think there's a fine line between, you know, accepting local knowledge and try to protect it without making it accessible and they're putting at risk, and also sort of dividing the city into almost small local ghettos and, you know, People are just using bikes. They're happy that them. People are doing microbuses. And I'm interested in having cross, cross. I know you're not saying that, suggesting that. But I'm, so one of the things we're trying to do, like uh, going back to the question of pedagogy, is like to, to bring students in private university to informal areas. And the first lesson is to, to, to break psychological barrier. It's not really physical, but psychological barrier. And once they get there, they know, oh, actually, the people are, you know, they're, they're living there. They have to go shop and this and that. And I think that's, that's part of the things that we try to, to break. But, but back to your question, uh, we, this, I think, goes to the first question of this session was, what are the uses or potential use of this mapping? And I think the question of standards and codes would potentially be a project that we hope would contribute to revising some of these question uh, standards, and also not just a question of standards of school, but a question of frame of reference. And I think Khalid Fami, the first session, talked about you know 19th century Cairo and looking to Paris as a frame of reference. We're living in a sort of similar, you know, kind of you know, what our codes and our standards are all built with, you know, it's, it's reference is actually outside, so we need to kind of revise that. Uh, just because we have five minutes left, so I want to wrap up. Uh, comment, comment, Iman, Okay, I was, I was gonna. Oh, are you first? Okay. Uh, two things. One is maybe instead of making the whole microbus uh, map, it, but basically what you're mentioning could be to. For example, we did a, a map of all the parks and which buses that go 
to particular uh, parks. I mean, maybe this is something could be interesting to do. I don't know what are the popular, is it the shopping malls or the cultural centers or the universities, but to show which routes uh, you can take. Could be a pilot project, might, might be easier. And uh, the other thought escapes me, so that wasn't meant to be. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just going to respond to the question of the use of maps and getting government interested and in, I think one of the things that has come up for us in working on this project was also just the potential misuse of maps and it started with us having to also in the early equipped sessions deal with a lot of people um, being very distrustful about why are you gathering this information what what are you going to do with it you know and I, I feel like we overcame that through the fact that these were working sessions and we did engage people in designing and developing the system. But also we've seen other maps, like there was a, a Baladi bar map that was made by someone and um, he had approached us about, you know, in part wanting to integrate some of his uh, ideas with our mapping system and then he said, oh well, you know, the sad thing is that so many of these bars, I've just went to visit them and they've all been shut down and I'm just mm -hmm. sitting there going, well, you know, what, <laughs> well, how do you think that happened? Okay. But I guess just to say, and I know that this has been an issue in other places, like in Beirut, where they did a conservation map for historically valuable buildings, wanting to try and preserve them, and it ended up being utilized by people who are land speculators. Or, I mean, it, this, so this is just a, a concern for anyone who's doing this kind of mapping. Some, I think it's what we're talking about also is lifestyles. Um, and when you talk about crossing over from, from one to another, I like that. Um, but mainly because mapping even is also quite subversive. So um, I appreciate what you do. Burham, yeah, Burham, yeah, it's a problem. Okay. Uh, my name is Ahmed Burham. I'll, I'll just, uh, just to not to talk too much, I'll just throw some stuff on the table that might be, a, uh, might be later taken into action. Like, uh, uh, relating to what uh, the user uh, of the mapping. Um, uh, can I talk in Arabic? If we talk about the user of the mapping, we are not just we have two, uh, يعني two levels. Either we have something called community mapping. We are going to the neighborhood in the street and we let people draw the street whatever they know about. And this is that we are doing today. The mapping is an exercise to reveal hidden hidden order. And hidden order, in relation to me, in relation to the artists, the artists, the specialists. So that goes goes the other on the educational, and that is that the students are not using are not aware of the mapping tools. So this can be like a course, a workshop. Mapping tools can go from uh, very ordinary stuff like using photos and uh, and uh, sketches, going to other like technical uh, softwares like uh, Jeffy and uh, and other stuffs. So like this is this can be taken into action further either in universities or even in the um, uh, initiatives. Other initiatives working on this. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, I'm, I, it's a bit thin in our universities. I'm, I'm, I'm not really part of the, and I think this is a big uh, gap in the education, uh, urban geography for sure. Uh, one thing that I'm doing on Cairo Observer, uh, they're just basic surveys, but it's a set of questions for neighborhoods, for people. I mean, it's full of problems. It's very partial, very, very partial. But it's a start. It's an attempt of an idea. Just to ask the same questions to different residents of the city. And it's an open survey. It's online. Anybody can go and fill it. But it gives us a sense. It allows people to just respond to say, how do they feel about their neighborhood? What do they like most? What are the main complaints? And I'm finding already, even though all I have so far is something like 30 responses, you find patterns. There's some things that clearly the person in Mu'attam who responded and the person in Do'i who responded and the person in Sitta of October and the person in Obur all actually share. They mostly have to do with municipal management, transport, and so on. So this is another form of mapping, not visual, but it's kind of a, a collecting just this is what town halls are supposed to do, but we don't have town halls, so what are we going to wait for democracy to arrive in a hundred years in some sort of uh, unrealistic way? No, I think we can find some other way to, to do this. But I think just to conclude, it sounds also to me that if we're trying to sort of map informality to make it accessible, whether visually through information or through user integration, uh, 
I, to me, the first step to doing this is to stop using the word informal. It's just not describing what we're talking about. And so we have an opportunity, I think, from the Cairo case, which I don't want to argue is unique, uh, to actually just come up with something new. Because informal still is grounded in this duality that's just not cutting it at this point with all this, this discussion. Uh, so this is one point. And just to give a quick example for closing, why mapping is so important uh, in the most basic sense. There's a town in the south of Egypt called Isna, which was once upon a time a very vibrant uh, economic town. Uh, all the boats drawn from south to north had to stop in Isna, so it had that kind of economy because all the boats had to stop there. Taking part of this uh, workshop, and I look forward to seeing you in other workshops and in the closing session. In the closing session, yes. And lunch is on the third floor.